last phase of the war against the Tamil people and its national leadership. From the president to its <laughs> most prominent ministers like Champekaranatunga and the most senior defense officers like Kota Be Rajapaksa made it clear <coughs> either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. Now, in this clear division, what we could see was that everybody in the island of Lanka who took a side on behalf of the Tamil's right to self-determination were justified as calling, being called as their terrorists. Now, Guru very clearly mentioned at least 89.7% of the journalists killed in Sri Lanka were Tamils. What about Lasantha? One could say that Lasantha was also killed, therefore freedom of expression has been suppressed generally. Lasantha was killed after his most famous editorial, the last hurrah of the nation publicly ridiculing, condemning the massive human cost that was caused by taking over of the Kilinachi by the Sri Lankan state security forces. So even amongst the Sinhala and the Muslim side, whoever spoke, Lasanta was a liberal journalist, not somebody who really uh, publicly asserted the right to self-determination of the Tamils but opposed the war. So whoever who faced a threat even amongst the Sinhalese and the Muslims faced it simply because they took one way or another a position opposing the war and opposing uh, racism uh, of the majority community. In that sense, we have to contextualize very concretely the threat faced by the journalists in Sri Lanka in a very specific way, but not in a general way. Second point. At the moment, at, at this moment, we see what is happening in Kobani, in the Turkish-Syrian border. There are at least about 40 tankers owned by ISIR moving forward. There is no color. It's full desert. It could be seen from air very clearly. And the PPK Kurdish fighters own very basic weapons. And they have been saying for several weeks, they are about to be annihilated. And from air, ISIL movement can be very clearly seen. Who has the power to stop? Who has the power to stop? If I don't talk about this at this moment, even though this is an event on the freedom of expression in Sri Lanka, I would be extremely hypocritical because we were saying the same in thousands <coughs> in London in 2009, May, March, April. Am I right? Who has the power to stop? Who had the power to stop? Now, PKK. Now, first they went after the Tamils and their national leadership. Now they are going after the Kurds and their national leadership. Sivaram, with a great foresight, clearly said, the whole Discourse of terrorism is a hoax, a facade. Don't refer to it. What did he mean by calling terrorism as a facade? Who created Al Qaeda? Who created ISIL? Who created Al Shabaab? Boko Haram? Groups are created to pave a path.
pathway for further invasion of the lands that could not be captured by the British American Axis. That is the hard cold truth. And in that process, the genuine revolutionary <coughs> liberational groups like the Tamil National Movement and the Kurdish National Movement were targeted. One movement was totally destroyed and the other is being destroyed at the moment. In that sense, terrorism is a hoax. In that sense, the Rajapaksa regime and the fundamentalist type of the Sri Lankan Buddhist state, ISIL, the Israeli state, have no difference. They fall into the same category, which are being formed, which are being protected, which are being diplomatically supported by the Anglo American axis. It's very clear. Where do we go from here? The third point. There's an ongoing psychological warfare waged against the Tamil people who still maintain some level of national consciousness. That is the unseen war, which is waged by UNHRC resolution, by different types of NGOs, by the media. How do they do that? They never use the word Tamil people. They use the word civilians, who are nameless, helpless, a crowd, a herd, abstract. In the latest UNHCR resolution, you don't find the word Tamil people. Instead, you find the preamble of the Sri Lankan constitution. Am I right to say that, Guru? Which says that the unitary state has to be protected. And the problem in Sri Lanka is a problem of simple repression of freedom of expression, <coughs> and breakdown of law and also individual human rights violation. And we are little by little unconsciously or consciously being absorbed into this psychological warfare. And in that, there is really a kind of a compromise that we have made with the powers who are and who are complicit and responsible of the massacres that were committed against us. The fourth point, what happened in Sri Lanka is not a simple breakdown of law, nor is it a violation of individual human rights, nor is it a general suppression of freedom of expression. It is a calculated, coordinated, systematic extermination of a national group and its national leadership, which continues to happen even today. Even today, my final request is, as journalists, we, one way or another, have a conscience. A collective conscience. A collective conscience where we are aware that this is not a question of terrorism, but it's a national question. And the powers who had the power to stop were complicit, deliberate. The Sri Lankan state could not have orchestrated its warfare even though they claim that it's their success. They could not have done it without the support of India, the US, and the British, and later by China. The moment we lose our own conscience and the collective consciousness, we are dead, even though we survive. We have been defeated.
even though we may organize so many things. The biggest, the biggest that that can happen to a community, to a journalist, to an organization, is the spiritual death, the moral death, losing of the conscience and the collective consciousness. And this is the hard cold truth. If we can fight back, Maintaining our conscience and the moral consciousness and the collective consciousness as journalists and as panels and as others who are involved in one way or another with a particular struggle, then there's some hope which we can concretize in so many ways. <coughs> but if we give it to the ongoing psychological warfare to reduce the collective struggle to individual right individual issues, <coughs> then we have already lost. I strongly believe that truth shall make us free. Thank you. <coughs> we can take a couple of questions. Uh, as uh, Dr. Jurlal has to be in the airport ASAP, so if you have any questions here, please raise your hands or maybe a couple. Uh, so, Jen, uh, I just wanted to ask you what is the solution? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, this is the problem. <laughs> you want a solution, not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I have no single answer. It's a collective answer. The problem is that we can't, we can't expect some others to give the solution. The problem is we are looking for a solution from the culprits. We are not victims. We are not helpless, inarticulate people. That is the problem. When we get into the mode of asking for a solution from someone, whereas we ourselves have the solution, which we have fought for at least 60 years. The Tamils have fought for at least for 60 years. There was a solution. There is a solution. I'm speaking only in terms of basic principles, not in concrete terms, which needs more time for further discussion. But the principles cannot be betrayed. If the Sri Lanka people, the journeys in Sri Lanka, they forgot the nationalism, you know, the collective sense, then they have already lost the individual rights. I find um, it is interesting because the situation is similar in China, because China, China has a huge um, issue of human rights. And when we're facing the intellectual, um, international pressures and accuses on our human rights problems. I think, like if, like the Chinese journeys, like the Sri Lanka people, Sri Lanka journalism, if we lose our like the Chinese collective sense, but focusing on the individual rights, if we lose China as a country, then we have been defeated as well. <laughs> so, what do you think? Yeah, you know. The, the question here is, let me say, um, who identifies the problem, who names the problem? This is the question. It is those who created the problem who names it, and they also provide the answer. Whereas, those victims, the oppressed groups, who have struggled for so long, with very concrete, tangible answers, are seen as terrorists seen as those who should be destroyed. Okay. Now coming to a concrete question that you raised in terms of you know, China, let's say the whole, uh, I was in China, Korea and Japan for one month during the, the, the spring, uh, both for academic and activist purposes. We accused China of imposing one child policy. Okay. And I crossed the border and came to Seoul. And in Seoul, when I met so many activists, they say, 
the young couples don't want to procreate in Seoul and in overall Korea because rearing a child, rearing up a child, and educating the child is enormously bloody expensive. <laughs> what do you say for that? And I moved to Osaka and Kyoto for two lectures. One of my closest friends, eldest brother, who was a robotic engineer, committed suicide just three days before I went there. And we had the bereavement ceremony. At that point, several academics who were quite progressive said, at least in Japan, there are 30,000 suicides per year. How do you call that? So naming one country as a rogue state, or naming one country's issues, or highlighting it as the issue, and not naming the others is extremely a calculated process of the major powers. That's what I have to say. So the role of the journalist is to go beyond these constructions, as someone said, if what appears to be the truth, what is the use of science and rationality? So um, I think can I understand? Are you saying we should like look at the, the structure and the cultural violence rather than merely looking at the physical violence when? reporting or facing the conflicts and um, violated. No, I don't mean to say that. I don't I I don't separate the physical violence <coughs> and cultural violence. When it comes to Tamils, physical violence and cultural violence are the same for them as a nation. The Tamils were, you know, targeted let me be a little bit uh, provocative, they were targeted simply because they were Elam Tamils. They claim the land in the north and east as their territory. That's it. That's it. With a distinct national identity, territorial identity. That's it. So there's a culture in the region, a national culture. This culture is not a static thing. It's changing. Elam Tamil culture is very modern. I don't want to go to Ramayana to prove it, as the Mahavamsa tries to do. No. I simply say it's a modern construction, which was built as a huge resistance to the hegemony of the Sinhala Buddhist state, which was created by the British, our great failures. <coughs> yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, you know the people tribunal verdicts have whatever happened in Sri Lanka was a genocide, but. Uh, the people tribunal is uh, powerless to punish these crimes, but we going through this channel, United Nation, but we still in the state to just kind of fact finding, investigation. So, where are we going forward? Like, is there any chance beyond the veto power we can move it to ICC and prove as it? Uh, war crime or crime against humanity or genocide and how much time it take in between that time what will happen to the people in the ground facing continuous genocide and assimilation and land grab and so many issues so the problem is as you know this is not rocket science you know a, any decision a, a quite a concrete decision that has a political impact is taken by the Security Council. Yes. When it was extremely clear that there was a massive mass atrocity taking place in the North and East, it was never referred to the Security Council. And later it was referred to the UNHCR, which is a teeth without horns. A horse without teeth, you know? It doesn't have power. Libya, how many casualties? Of course, Syria was referred, you know, earlier. But in Tamalila, so it's not ignorance, it's not lack of knowledge, it's a calculated, you know, plan. And then referring the case to UNHCR 
is also a well-calculated plan to change the language of the whole struggle, to reduce it to mere a human rights discourse, where even the word Tamil is not mentioned. So the, first of all, my suggestion is we have to identify where the problem is in terms of international lobby. One could say, well, I am tactically lobbying in the U UN HCR, but it is not my, my place for the struggle. I have to work with the grassroots. I have to work with the people in the North and East. And I have to work at least relatively with progressive uh, politicians, not of course with the conservative, Tamil conservatives, Tamils for conservatives in the UK. Okay. But we, we need to, you know, at least move forward with some progressive levels and the governments. We at the Ecuadorian uh, diplomat in Geneva. And at the beginning, she was defending the Sri Lankan state. We spent one hour with her. And little by little, she smiled. And she knew everything. <coughs> at last. Not because that we told her. She, she said it's simply because that we do not want the US to take the upper hand in the Indian Ocean. We said, want the US to stop it. We said the US has taken the upper hand in the Indian Ocean by strengthening the Sri Lankan state. That is why UNHRA's resolution clearly recognizes the unitary character of the state. And she was open for further discussion. So there are, there are member states, there are certain countries, there are certain political parties with whom we can go forward. The problem is when our energy, when our concentration, when our focus is elsewhere, which is extremely misleading, then the whole attention of the diaspora is being, is being uh, given to something else, which, which is not at all productive. It becomes counterproductive and dangerous and misleading. Sorry, Julia, you're running on time. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you.